Hello, everyone. Welcome to Risk Roundup. Democratization of space is on its way. Terrestrial planets, gas giants, Trojan asteroids, and a range of other bodies orbiting the sun are beginning to be explored for precious metals by pioneers. This will not only help us understand how the sun and its family of planets formed, but also help us prepare for what the future may hold for the human race. Precious metals have influenced the course of recorded human history and today and coming tomorrow will likely not be any different. Nations today feel that there are not enough precious metal resources on earth to meet everyone's need and that we need to look to space to meet our existing and emerging needs on earth. Moreover, the dooming belief that everything we hold of value on earth is in finite amounts is now being questioned as metals, minerals, energy sources and more are literally in near infinite quantities in our solar system. Understandably, human exploration horizon is now expanding to space, where the space mining seems to be more practical than professed. Today, there are visible signs emerging from across nations that mining asteroids for precious metals is becoming a very realistic goal. However, the question remains whether we have the technology and means for space mining, whether space mining is a viable industry and whether nations are prepared for what is to come. To discuss space mining further, I'm honored to welcome Daniel Faber to Risk Roundup. Daniel is a pioneer of space technologies and mining and currently president and CEO of Heliocentric Technologies. He's also on the advisory board of National Space Society and is based in the United States. Welcome, Daniel. We are honored and delighted to have you on Risk Roundup. Thank you. It's great to be here. Wonderful. So it seems that plans are already being made to launch tiny robotic spacecraft that will sit in low Earth orbit testing technologies for future asteroid prospecting missions. While space mining seems to be still in its infancy, where do you think we are heading? So I think all of the technologies exists now for uh, for the early asteroid mining missions. Um, in NASA and, uh, and, and a lot of government agencies have been launching satellites now for almost 50 years. And uh, uh, private companies started launching satellites 30 years ago for communications and then for remote sensing. So there's a, there's a lot of, of infrastructure that's been built. There's a lot of technology that's been built. Um, the, there have been missions out to asteroids. Recently, the European Space Agency sent a mission to a comet, which is a lot further away than the asteroids that, uh, that companies are looking to mine. And that was a, a very successful mission. They tested a lot of things and they found out uh, a lot of good information that confirmed what we thought the asteroids would, made, would be made of. Uh, so we, we're, we're bullish on, the, on knowing the composition and on having the technology. So the, the result of this is that um, uh, given, given sufficient financing, a company right now could launch an asteroid mining mission. Um, however, what we're trying to do is reduce the cost of that and close the business case. And, uh, and so there's a few steps in that. Uh, I expect to see asteroid mining become a reality uh, in the, the six to ten year time frame. Um, you know, it'll take uh, some time to develop the exact spacecraft that will do the mining and then for them to, to fly those missions and, and come back. So it seems like we are almost on the doorstep of that. So while space mining of the moon and nearby asteroids would allow for greater access to hydrogen, carbon, silicon, metals and many other materials that may be overmined on this planet Earth, what else is being explored for mining in our solar system? What are we looking for? So I think I'm going to disappoint you initially because actually the mining companies right now aren't really looking at the precious metals. Uh, they, they also aren't really looking to bring anything back to the surface of the earth, not, uh, not in terms of um, commodities that, uh, that we mine terrestrially. Because what we, uh, what we found when we did the economic analysis before we started Deep Space Industries was that the terrestrial uh, markets are ready, they're, they're highly efficient, there's, uh, there's a lot of material in the earth and um, market economics play uh, successfully to the point where the cost of extracting those materials is, is driving the, the price of, the, of selling those materials. So the interplay between availability of materials in the ground and, uh, and technology and, uh, and market demand is, is setting production quantities and pricing uh, quite successfully. When we, when we looked at this uh, asteroid mining and the potential there, um, because of all the risks, because of, of 
the fact it hasn't been done, the technology is not mature, the costs are going to be very high. Also realize that launching anything from the ground costs five to $10 million per ton of equipment just to get it to low Earth orbit. When you consider all of the extra tonnage of, uh, of rocket fuel needed to, to send it out to an asteroid, um, you know, it's, it's really very expensive to, to put equipment up there. Uh, so what we found was that um, there's actually demand for that rocket fuel in orbit uh, that has to get lifted from the ground. And it's, it's very simple materials. It's hydrogen, oxygen, hydrocarbons, uh, things like that. These are things that exist on the asteroids and that we can extract, bring them back to Earth orbit, and sell them at a, at a price that is equal to the launch price, uh, and, and slowly make that price go down. So we can sell that material for maybe $5 million a tonne, which is, which is quite a high price when you think about selling water and, and simple hydrocarbons uh, at $5 million a tonne. So that, that can close the business case. And so really what we're going after is water. Water is the first one. It's the most simple. Uh, at Deep Space Industry, we built a thruster that is, that is tuned to run on water. And so we can use that as the, as the reaction mass to, to push ourselves forward. And, uh, and we're, we're installing those thrusters on a lot of satellites now. So in that way, really, it's, it's starting off being about as boring as mining can be. We're mining water. Uh, this is I was hoping for something really exciting because I read that there are some asteroids where uh, there are so many precious metals like platinum and uh, one asteroid is probably a complete diamond because of uh, the way it has frozen. So it, we could have a diamond as big as a hurt. So I was hoping something really exciting, but <laughs> water will do. Water is also very exciting. So. Uh, at this point, like you said, you know, you're right that the business case, because, you know, we will have to take all the manufacturing, mining equipments and how to bring back all that, uh, uh, what we can get from the asteroid. It's still very expensive. There is, uh, you know, we still have to figure out how to make the technology more cost effective, how to make the process more cost effective. And like you said, there are still many, many risks which we'll have to figure out, we, uh, starting from who owns the space, who owns the asteroids, a lot of things needs to be discussed. But uh, like you said, water and fuels, they are going to be very, very important too. And if we want to go towards the space age, we will need these resources. So how do we decide what is the best place to get the water, which asteroids to go or which where in the space we are going to look for water and what technology will be used for that? Yeah, so having decided that water is the first thing that we want to get and that, that we think there's a market for that, um, we looked at, at what the asteroid population is. And there's, there's millions of asteroids floating in the main asteroid belt outside of Mars orbit. That's a, that's a long way from Earth. It takes a lot of fuel to get there. And when we're extracting the water to use as fuel, we'd use a lot of it up coming back. So what we really want is asteroids that are easier to reach, that take less fuel to reach. And, uh, and it turns out that there are quite a number of asteroids that are easier to reach than the surface of the moon. Uh, despite the fact that they're in independent orbits around the sun, those orbits are relatively close to that of Earth, and they don't have a gravity well like the moon. So we don't need the fuel to go down and come up from the surface of the moon. And so we've, we've designed missions around those, and, and everyone is, is looking now at this population of, of near-Earth asteroids. So uh, I think there's something like um, uh, 1,500 asteroids that we know of that are easier to reach than the surface of the moon in terms of the amount of fuel required. Now, of those asteroids, some of them are stony. Some of them are, are effectively made of rock. They're like the, the surface of a planet that got shattered. Some of them are made of metal. And this is the, the interesting ones that, that you might have heard of. They're uh, almost complete uh, pure stainless steel, nickel and iron with, with precious metals and things like that. Um, neither of those are interesting to us because they don't have water on them. They don't have hydrocarbons. But there's another class uh, of asteroids called the carbonaceous chondrites that haven't been differentiated. This is primordial material from the beginning of the solar system. And so it has a mix of elements that were just present at the beginning of the solar system before the sun started to push the, uh, the lighter elements out when it ignited. And, uh, and those elements are you know, very abundant in water and, and in hydrocarbons. So we can match the reflection spectra that we see, basically the color of the asteroid. We can match that to the reflection spectra we have on meteorites, which is an excellent collection of, of the 20 different types. And I mentioned three, but there's about 20. Um, and so by matching that spectrum, we can say, okay, this asteroid is at least completely covered uh, water-rich material. So we can assume that the whole asteroid is, is made of that material. 
Now, we have to go and verify that. There's a prospecting phase, and this is why uh, it, it adds to the risk. But you can see how now we select the asteroids that are accessible and that contain the material that we want. No, it makes sense. And so from what you're saying, it seems that in our solar system, we have asteroids that can really become self-fueling gas stations for space exactly right. or, you know, any other mission that may that we may have. So you see that as a possibility that we will be able to use these asteroids as a self-fueling gas stations? That's exactly right. Where we want the fuel, though, is in low Earth orbit. 50% uh, of everything that gets launched, and I mentioned the cost before, 5 to $10 million per ton, 50% of everything that gets launched is fuel to take those satellites to a higher orbit or to move them around in their orbit. So uh, last year, I think uh, $6 billion was spent on launch vehicles. $3 billion worth of that launch capacity was used to launch fuel. So this is not a trivial market. Um, it's, it's a good place to start. But we need to deliver that fuel where it's needed in low Earth orbit. And that means bringing the material back from the, the asteroid, which is, which is in an orbit around the sun, as it slowly moves past the Earth, we just, we just um, change the trajectory, not of the whole asteroid, just of the water that we've extracted. So we'll bring back in 100 tons, 1,000 tons, those kind of quantities uh, into low Earth orbit, and then that's the, uh, the gas station that, uh, that will be provided. That, that is the beginning, but if there is the water on those asteroids and in the other places in space, then we, the humans, we can go and scrape the space materials to construct orbiting hotels or, you know, we can build space colonies. We can, uh, we don't, if there is water and then we can draw building materials there. So there is a lot that can happen just by, you know, our ability to find water in space and on these asteroids. So it is important step, but I think there is a lot that we can, you know, build on that once we are able to find water and we are able to successfully uh, draw some building materials there. Is that a possibility? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I, I look around this room and, and you can't see it, but you can look around your room. Everything was mined. Everything was pulled out of the ground. All the material that you're looking at, the the, the walls, the floors, and, and unless you have some wood, in which case it was grown, but everything else was mined from the ground. But mining is a fraction of the global economy. What matters is not the, the material, the raw material you extract. What matters is what you do with it. But unless you have that material, you can't do anything. And consider the cost. It's $5 million per ton of equipment to move it to space. I, I like to say pe to people, if, if it cost that much to ship equipment to Australia, I wouldn't have this terrible accent. Nothing would be happening in Australia. The amazing thing is, despite the cost of $5 million per ton, we still do things in space. That is staggering. That's how valuable um, you know, space is for telecommunications and remote sensing and, and, and scientific research. But if we drop that cost, and there's a lot of converging technologies, and it's not just asteroid mining, but we're seeing 3D printing, we're seeing satellite servicing, so satellites can come and go and, and assemble uh, each other. Uh, fuel depots, of course, uh, enabled by, by asteroid mining as well. Uh, there's, a, there's a number of different technologies that will create a complete paradigm shift in what we're able to do in space. And, and everything that you've suggested, buildings, cities, um, you know, sports arenas, hotels, uh, trips to the moon, all of these things will become possible. As the prices drop, more and more people will also then uh, be able to experience that until the point where uh, there's enough material just in the near Earth asteroids, just in this fraction of the population that are close, that, that come close to the Earth's orbit. There's enough material to support about 100 billion people in, in space. Once you go out to the asteroid belt, it's about a million times more material. So there's, there's a long way we can go before we, uh, we run out of things to do in this solar system. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And I mean, you are right that at this point, it is not cost effective for us to uh, take our spaceship uh, and then, you know, get the asteroid down or get the material from the asteroid down for processing. That becomes the back and forth trip becomes very, very expensive. But if we figure out a way to develop the technologies, to develop the manufacturing and mining technologies and equipment, everything in space, then in near future, I'm sure it's not today, but in the near, very near future, we will be able to do the asteroid mining and processing right there in the space, right there on the asteroids. And uh, hopefully that will just bring the finished product back home here on the Earth. So that is also a possibility. I'm sure you know there are a lot of uh, advances happening in that area. And uh, a lot of understanding is, you know, going on the scientific uh, 
and we will be able to figure out how to do all that in the near future. But before we, I mean, even for just to get the water, it is important to understand the environment because we, we do need the, each asteroid has different environment. The way they have been created, they all have very different uh, environment around them. So it's not like if we understand one environment about one asteroid that we will be able to understand everything about every other asteroid that is out there in the space. So it requires a lot of understanding and a lot of you know research scientific advances needs to happen even for the processing of water, getting the water, getting the building material. So do we have enough understanding of the environment, space environment, asteroid environment at this point? So if you consider mining on Earth, um, geology has been a, an evolving scientific field for, for millennia, if you like. Uh, that didn't stop uh, the Romans or the Egyptians from, from having mines and extracting material. What it's made is modern mining is much more efficient. Uh, the process of, of discovering new resources, uh, extracting them and cleaning up afterwards it is now a much more efficient uh, process. Uh, and so we'll see the same kind of thing. First of all, the, the asteroid mining activities will be towards targets that are uh, rich in materials, and also the price will be high. Uh, as, we, as we develop, as, as time goes by, demand increases, the, the, the output from the mines increases, efficiency improves, the geological understanding, but the operational understanding, everything will, will improve, and that will drive the costs down. But, um, but I don't think that uh, the level of understanding we have now is any impediment. I think we do know enough to go out. We know that some of the water, some of the asteroids are water bearing uh, and contain hydrocarbons. And, and those are exactly what we want. Now, there's risk. There's, there's more risk that the, uh, the grade of the material you go to is not the highest grade, which is, which is where you'd want to start. But that risk within the, the context we have is likely acceptable. In fact, it, it is acceptable. And that's why the, the companies right now are, are pursuing asteroid mining. Yes, no, that I, I understand all those different, you know, risk variables out there. Now, when we, even for extracting water, even for uh, getting any other building material or anything uh, at this point, what uh, are the, you know, goals that uh, the community has established, uh, the explorers have established, are they equipments, whatever we use, are they going to be fueled by, uh, powered by the fuels or will it be solar powered? How would it work? Because we are trying to build the uh, fuel stations in uh, space on the asteroids. And uh, those fuel stations, how do you plan it to power it? By using the fuels itself or by using the solar energy? So at the moment, um, you have to consider that, that when you pull hydrocarbons out of the ground on Earth, you can burn them because the air contains oxygen. When we go to the asteroids, we, we don't have that chemical disequilibrium. Uh, at least we're not expecting to find two things that we could burn. What, uh, what we have to do then is put energy in. So if you take water, you can split it into hydrogen and oxygen, which you can then burn later as a, as a propellant in a, in a you know, traditional rocket engine. Um, but you have to put a lot of electricity in to, to split the, the water into its hydrogen and oxygen. So slowly you accumulate energy storage and then you can use it all at once. Or alternatively, you could just take electricity and use that to accelerate the, the water molecules without having to split them. Um, an electric propulsion system, uh, think of it as a particle accelerator. Um, and, and that can be very, very efficient. That can be more fuel efficient than, than burning the hydrogen and oxygen um, because you can accelerate it to higher velocities using electricity. So there's a whole range of things that can be done to, to make propulsion, to, to move yourself around once you have a reaction mash to push against. Um, and so, so really that, that water is just, it's a reaction mass. And then there are several things you can do with it, but the electricity, the, the energy that drives any of these systems, uh, you have to get that from somewhere. So there's a, there's a small number of options. You can't burn the hydrocarbons cause there's no free oxygen. Uh, you can either get it from solar or you can launch a, a nucleus a power system. Um, that's about it. Uh, and so, um, we, we've been looking at solar because nuclear, launching nuclear uh, on unreliable rockets is, is not really palatable. And uh, until there's, there's a mature in-orbit uh, um, nuclear industry, then I don't think that's going to happen for a long time. So we've looked at, at solar, uh, just launching solar arrays like, uh, like every other satellite does. But the, uh, the interesting changes with 3D printing and with the availability of hydrocarbons, which we can turn into plastics uh, from the asteroid, We'll be able to make massive solar concentrators 
And then at the focal point of the solar concentrator, you can put a, a turbine just like we have on Earth, or you can put a Stirling engine, or you can put a photovoltaic array or something like that. But a, a 100 meter diameter solar reflector is collecting about 10 megawatts of power. And, uh, and so when we get to that kind of scale, and that there's a lot of energy coming out of the sun, it's just a matter of having a large reflector to collect it all. Of course, at the beginning, we don't need those kind of scales. It's, uh, it's all uh, a lot more modest to, uh, to bootstrap this industry, uh, and it's going to be photovoltaics. Sure, no solar makes sense. What you are saying, you know, I think solar makes sense there. Now, going to the solar systems, hard bodies, and extracting any valuable resources, starting from water, and bringing either, you know, home, maybe in the coming years we may need to bring water home or you know using it there for something building something or creating something new will require so much planning and preparation and at the same time it would also require evaluating all possible risk scenarios what is the status of risk assessment as far as, far as the space mining or even you know space exploration goes who is responsible for managing space uh, space risk at this point Hmm. So when we when we're eventually returning material to the surface of the Earth, this becomes much more of a pressing question, and and that will happen as the the, the mining technologies develop. Um, you know, there will come a day when it is more cost effective to bring nickel or, or platinum or something from an asteroid to the Earth. That's I don't know how many decades off that is. I I, I hate speculating about things that, uh, uh, that 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 could be a year away or or a hundred years. Um, but you know, we, we then have to be a lot more conscious about what we're doing to the atmosphere, where we're landing the, the, uh, the material, uh, and you know, what the controls are so that it lands in the right place, not the wrong place, um, and, and has no detrimental effects. But even, even with mining uh, in orbit, we, we don't want to drop large amounts of material accidentally on the Earth. Um, and you know, it's, it's hard to drop things accidentally. We, we choose an operational scenario that, that really has, uh, has mitigated that risk. But, um, but you, you ask, okay, who, who, who is in charge of monitoring that risk? In order to get uh, communication licenses to operate any of this equipment, uh, in America, you have to go to the, uh, the FCC, the, the Federal Communications Commission, to, uh, to get a license. If you have a, an imaging system that's, that's looking at the Earth, you need to go to, to NOAA, the uh, National Oceanic and, and Air, Air Aeronautical uh, Association Administration, uh, and, and they license uh, remote sensing systems. Uh, if you want to get a launch license to, to launch equipment, you go to the um, FAA, the, the Federal Aviation Authority, and they um, and they will they will issue you a license once you've satisfied them that you've met all of the requirements and minimised uh, sufficiently the risks that they are aware of. So there are agencies in the US, and every country has a, has a similar type of thing. Um, these agencies, or some of them, report up to UN bodies uh, for for the Outer Space Treaty or the International Telecommunications Union. So there's a there's an international um, layer of of you know, risk management, if you like to consider that, of, of oversight. So all, all of these things already exist for uh, the current space industry, and and they'll be applied and and you know, developed and matured as necessary to uh, to make sure that that the risks are suitably managed. <clears throat> for the uh, for the asteroid mining industry as well. Uh, what, what you said that these all these organizations that you need to approach to get the licenses that is one thing, but they are those licenses in the questionnaires or whatever requirements one fulfills to get that license. That is not the risk management. Uh, when when we are talking about space uh, mining in future or at this point space even space exploration. It requires a whole new kind of uh, risk management or risk uh, assessment because now, because of the computer core and connected computer, the cyberspace, geospace and space, everything is connected. The hardware and software that will be used for uh, space mining exploration, asteroid, asteroid mining exploration or any other exploration, that because that, that has the connect connectivity and they are connected, through some sort of internet. Now everything is connected, cyberspace, geospace, and space. And we need to look at the risk arising from any of this activity. It's simple, even research, you know, uh, that we are trying to do there, or even simple water extraction, or uh, building anything, or uh, trying to mine in the future, asteroid mining, all of 
that is going to require very, very different kind of integrated CGS risk assessment as uh, we say cyberspace, geospace, space, integrated risk assessment. And at this point, I don't see anybody that uh, is qualified to do that or even thinking from that direction that these are the possible risks that would emerge. Getting license is one thing. They, they are not concerned about integrated overall risk. They, once they issue license, they are not going to think about what kind of uh, risk you know, could arise out of uh, any activity that is going to happen or any scenarios that could be developing. That is not going to be their role. So we do, I, I, am, uh, I have a serious concerns about uh, how are we going to manage the emerging risk coming from the space because of any activity due their exploration to mining. And I just don't see those uh, requirements at this point or any organizations that are actively looking at uh, risk from that perspective. But from your assessment at this point, what risk concerns you the most as organizations like yours and others are getting ready to do this space exploration or uh, asteroid mining or asteroid exploration? So I think there is a, a lot of risk assessment being done. And historically, and, and of course, uh, still and into the future, perhaps even more so, uh, space is the high ground for, for um, you know, a strategic uh, defense posture. Uh, space gives you gives you the advantage of of being above everything and seeing everything, uh, and and sometimes uh, you know being able to access everything. So ever since um, in World War II, the the Germans started launching rockets. Uh, everyone has around the world has been very sensitive to a lot of the uh, of those types of of risks. And so a lot of risk assessment is done uh, in a military type perspective, looking at. Um, you know, who is doing what, how it is done, how to build in the safeguards. And these things are built into all of these licenses that I mentioned before. Now, it's done from, from a, a military defense, you know, national security perspective. But, uh, and there's, there's definitely scope for, um, you know, other types of risk assessment and, uh, and other types of, of mitigation. As we get to asteroid mining, which is a, something that hasn't happened previously, there'll need to be some more layers on that. But uh, the, the combination of looking at the, the cybersecurity issues and how uh, hacking a, a, an orbital fuel depot um, might be used against uh, another actor. And the, these are things that are being thought about in some circles. Uh, from, a, from a company's perspective, um, you know, the, the asteroid mining companies are startup companies at the moment. And, uh, and the biggest risk to them is the existential risk that their business models fail. Um, so the, the companies aren't focused on that, but when they go for licenses and everything, those those discussions start in earnest with the with the authorities. So it does work its way in 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 some ways. Um, you know, I, I'll definitely freely admit that a, a holistic risk assessment has not been made public, and I and I don't know whether it has been done. Uh, it would surprise me if um, you know national security. Uh, agencies haven't done very detailed risk assessments of, of this, but, uh, but those aren't public. Sure. No, I, I think the challenge is so far, there are only limited players. The, not, uh, there were, the democratization of space was not there. Now, the space is a contested common. We have we are seeing the nano satellites. It's like in thousands, they are being uh, launched. Anybody wants to launch a nano satellite, they can do that, small satellites. Now, uh, even for the space mining, the futuristic, if you are talking about asteroid mining, any because now it's a contested common, anybody would be able to uh, get into that field. So the players are going to increase. At this point, probably we have about half a dozen, but in the coming years, that number is going to gradually increase. And as more and more uh, private public, uh, you know, partnership or even just the private enterprises decide to get into the space to do asteroid mining when they hear that there is so much there are so much riches over there there is so much uh, resources uh, that they can extract that are so valuable on earth then a lot of people and a lot of organizations are going to emerge that would be interested in going so it, what the way we manage risk before we will not be able to manage risk that way in the coming years because of the very fact that it's a contested space is a contested uh, commons and there is going to be a lot of competition, a lot of uh, involvement and very heavy, heavy uh, adventures will be you know planned and carried out. So in the coming years, a lot of things are going to be different. But now 
the one question is that when we decide to explore the space or do the space mining or do the asteroid mining, are we going to largely carry out uh, these missions using robots or humans are going to be extensively involved in the, on the field? Uh, at the beginning, it's going to be heavily robotic. Um, and so yeah, that's, that's a, um, a fact of the cost to keep, uh, to keep human, to put humans in space, keep them alive and happy. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an incredibly expensive thing right now. That cost will change. That will change dramatically. The availability of resources from asteroids will help that as will all, all of the other technologies I mentioned previously. So, uh, that's, um, you know, that, that's something that we can look forward to, but right now, um, you know, everything has to be uh, robotic in order to be cost effective, which means that uh, that we tackle the simple problems that uh, that we can solve robotically, um, but also that we have to to develop some fairly advanced robotics and teleoperation to ensure that that uh, every uh, every uncertainty, everything that uh, that we come across, can be can be mitigated. So uh, so yeah, expect it to be highly roboticized, simply uh, or um, driven largely by the cost of uh, of having people in space. Sure. No, absolutely. Now, it seems that, as you uh, mentioned in the beginning, that water is the primary interest at this point for sp space exploration, uh, because uh, mostly because it could help keep a space colony alive if we are trying to, you know, build a space colony. And what my question is that do we have a promising lead on water, like where we would find a lot of water in space? Yeah, water. Water is is most useful uh, initially as fuel. Uh, but of course, has a lot of uses once uh, once a human population starts living in space, which which I also predict will will start happening within the next ten years. But the um, uh, where to where to get the water was your question. Um, the answer is the carbonaceous chondrite asteroids. We we have uh, um, samplings of these asteroids from the meteorites. There are uh, a couple of hundred thousand meteorites that have been picked up around the world. And, uh, and analyzed. And based on the reflection spectrum, basically that the color of those rocks, we can match to the color of the asteroids and say, okay, these ones are, are very likely to be exactly the same composition. And this one has water in it. It, it might be 10 or 20% water. It might be trapped in, in salts or clays or um, uh, in, in other forms. But, um, but there, there's water in there that can be extracted uh, using the right process. And so, and so those are the targets. And, uh, uh, somewhere between uh, 40 and 60 percent of the asteroid population is water bearing. That's interesting. That's very interesting. So what initiatives are currently underway by both public and private sector to meet the growing demands of resources on Earth? One, you described that, you know, there is, of course, you know, everyone is looking for water. What else we are looking for at this point? So uh, again, the asteroid mining is not looking to provide um, resources to the Earth to terrestrial markets. Not at this stage. So, uh, so the things that we're looking for uh, to provide are, are things that can be used in space that currently have a very high cost because they need to be lifted off the ground, even if they're just dumb atoms. Uh, you know, this is th this bottle of water uh, is is perhaps a, a half a kilo. That would uh, that would cost something like um, five thousand dollars. In, in just just to get it on a on a rocket into space, yes, so yes. so we're looking for for fuel because because that's a lot of dumb atoms, and uh, and so that's water which is hydrogen oxygen uh, and it's also hydrocarbons, uh, and we can then do some chemistry and turn those into things that can be burned, or, or you can do some uh, you know ionization and acceleration electrically and and uh, and throw them out the back really fast. But rocket rockets are basically throwing atoms out the back as fast as they can, uh, and for that you want uh, light atoms that uh, that are easily manipulated. So um, you know, hydrocarbons and, and water are, are a great place to start. Beyond that, uh, expect to see the hydrocarbons being turned into 3D printer feedstock uh, plastics, uh, and then also nickel and iron were very abundant on the asteroids and uh, and also easily manipulated. So uh, so that will be the first sort of metals that get used, and they can be used for for structures, for trusses, for pressure vessels, for antennas, uh, for for um, solar concentrators, you know, a lot of things right now that uh, that we could use that material for if we had it in orbit, and we had an appropriate 3D printer, and that's where okay. the, the convergence of of all of these technologies is headed. Yes, that's so it seems now. Space mining explorations are possible because of astronomical data that is available uh, based on space-based telescope and you know more. So, who actually owns the astronomical data? 
So the, the astronomy data that, uh, that has uh, detected the population of asteroids, um, yeah, that, that's all collected by researchers around the world. Um, some of it isn't published, some of it that the researchers are, are sitting on, but uh, private citizens with telescopes have discovered asteroids. Um, more often it's, it's uh, large government-owned telescopes, government-funded programs. And uh, just as, as all um, scientific research that's government-funded, it finds its way into the academic literature uh, through journal articles and publications or, or through the, the, the bulk release of data, which then other scientists can, uh, can do analysis of. So it becomes part of a, a database uh, of asteroids, uh, not just their positions, but also if we have the reflection spectra, we can make assumptions about their composition, the, the type of the asteroid, um, all, all these kinds of things. And so these databases, there are uh, two or three that are curated around the world, one by the Minor Planet Center, another by the Jet Propulsion Lab, uh, NASA JPL, uh, and, and I believe there's a European one as well. So um, those databases, again, publicly available, you can download them, they're, they're effectively a, a common good. And this reflects what we also see in the terrestrial mining industry where governments do uh, regional geophysics surveys and they make the geophysics available. Uh, and, and that's you know, part of mapping the country is to map it not just uh, the, the topography, but also the geophysics, the magnetics, the, the gravity. The, the, there are several different ways that, that the Earth is mapped. And, uh, and then miners uh, and geologists will look at that map and say, well, this is an interesting anomaly. This may correlate to a deposit of something that I'm interested in. I'll go and put a hole in the ground and, and, and drill, a, drill a sample hole and see what's there. So that's the stage that, that we're at now with the asteroid mining. We have this, this regional geophysics data, so to speak. We have this, this database of asteroids. We're looking at that database and saying, oh, what's, what's the most interesting? What's accessible? What appears to have the things we're looking for, the, the water and the hydrocarbons? Right, let's, let's go out to a few of those and verify that, that it is what we think. And then we'll, we'll think about a mining operation on the highest grade uh, asteroid that, uh, that, we can, that we've assessed. And that's, that's the, the process. Yes, yes, and I understand that. Now, understandably, organizations, uh, both public and private uh, enterprises like yours, are getting up for exploration. What implications do you see because of the increased space exploration in the coming years? Um, I think that uh, the increased launch rates uh, are going to drive down uh, launch prices uh, somewhat. There's a, an expectation that launch prices will halve in the next uh, five to ten years. And, uh, and so, you know, instead of $5 million a ton, it might be $2 million or even $1 million a ton to launch equipment. It'll still be very expensive, but that will make things more accessible and, and more activities will take place. All those other technologies that I mentioned, 3D printing, uh, satellite servicing, the asteroid materials, fuel depots, these will also drive down the operations cost of doing things in orbit. And that will mean that, that just a lot more businesses become viable. So space tourism, um, Will, will become viable, various entertainment activities in space, um, uh, setting up uh, perhaps large solar concentrators and, and, uh, and power systems and being able to beam power to the earth, that may become viable. Um, there's a lot of things that, that people have talked about. Uh, and so you know, at the end of the day, we, we don't know what all of the possibilities are going to be, but there are companies now that are manufacturing material in space to, to bring back to the earth to sell. And despite the fact that it costs $5 million per tonne to launch it, and even more to bring it back um, because you have to launch the heat shields and everything to bring it back through the atmosphere. Despite that staggering cost, the materials that they're making are valuable enough that they're finding markets uh, and closing these business cases. Um, there's a, a lot of um, research, of course, that's happening uh, on the International Space Station, but um, you know, there are advantages and disadvantages to that facility. As the costs come down, we'll be able to do more research, different types of research, and uh, you know, pharmaceuticals is, a, is going to be a big beneficiary of this, um, but but also a lot of other sciences. But then the, the there are there are things that sorry, let me let, let me interrupt. How is pharmaceutical going to be a big beneficiary? So uh, genes are expressed differently in microgravity. When you consider um, what we, what we're able to do is remove the force that governs the macroscopic organization of matter, and even though you might think a cell is small still affected by gravity. Different gradients are set up, there's buoyancy inside the cell. It affects how the cell behaves. So what has been found is that uh, when you put uh, any living organism in space, the gene expression is different. So some genes turn on and off and give it slightly different characteristics, which is 
which is frankly what you expect. If I put you in a hot room, genes for staying cool will turn on and your body will go into a cooling mode. If I put you in a cold room, you'll start shivering. That's a gene expression that's causing then your muscles to twitch to warm you up. When you're in space, the, the organism is trying to react to that, perhaps not sure exactly what it's doing because it hasn't had a, an evolved response to this. But some genes will turn on and some genes will turn off. That, that gene expression change can result in some very interesting things. So people are now starting to really dig into this and say, okay, what, what happens? What can we learn? What genes get expressed that we didn't realize were, were, were even interesting genes? And doing a lot of research around that. So one example that's, that's a concrete example is uh, pancreatic islet cells. These are the cells that make insulin in the body. Um, it's very difficult to get them to grow uh, in, a, in, a, in a lab in quantity that you could use to make an artificial pancreas. But an artificial pancreas would be a wonderful thing for the world because you know, people wouldn't have to inject themselves with insulin if they have diabetes. It turns out that in space, you can grow the stem cells and get them to differentiate into, into pancreatic islet cells. In, uh, and much more efficiently in a, on a production scale. So one possibility is to, to take up somebody's stem cells, make these uh, pancreatic islets, put them into an artificial pancreas, bring it back to the ground and give somebody the surgery. This would be a, a, a fantastic step forward. So people are thinking about how they can do this, but also what other things can we do? So like I said, I think that the possibilities for uh, biological research and, and potential pharmaceuticals are, are huge, absolutely huge. So it, it definitely seems it is a huge initiative and I'm glad that it is thought from that perspective because gene expression is so very important even on earth here. If we look at the gene expression of any different individual uh, who is in a polluted environment or a non-polluted environment in a clean environment, the gene expression is different. That's if right. you are in a clean environment, the genes would not express and there a lot of diseases would not happen. If you live in a polluted environment, uh, the same genes, you know, are going to express and you will, uh, an individual would end up with so many different diseases. So I'm glad that that initiative is start from that perspective and there are further studies going on, which will definitely, you know, help uh, not only pharmaceutical industry, but the overall healthcare industry. So that is certainly a good initiative. Now, space is a contested common. And if a party is already any public or private enterprise is already at an asteroid and mining it even for water or fuels, can a second party come along and mine it as well? How are we going to define all the processes and standards of what is possible, what we can do and what we cannot do? There's nothing in the laws of physics that stop that happening, of course. So, so you then revert. Uh, sorry, <clears throat> you then revert to the laws of man to decide what we're going to allow and what we're not going to allow. And that's uh, you know, how, how does the world choose to operate like that? Uh, and and there may be bad actors that um, that then go against whatever the regulations are. And so, will there be some sort of policing enforcement, or how will this get established? All of these things uh, for space uh, for asteroid mining really have yet to play out the um when we look at the uh, at what happened what's happened terrestrially globally mining regulations have tended to converge on something that works something that's pragmatic so that investors can come in and, and put their money at risk that you know maybe the rocks in the ground aren't what they think maybe the uh, the market will change maybe the the operations will just be more difficult uh, and uh, and we won't get the extraction percentages. They put that money at risk. They make a big investment. And if somebody comes along and takes that material, or, or you know takes advantage of the fact that they've done enough research now that this company has invested a billion dollars and is ready, or a hundred million dollars and is ready to build a mine, someone can't just come along and jump on top of that and and, uh, and take advantage of that. So the investors are protected by um, by the regulations which grant them secure tenure. And that may be in the form of ownership, it may be a lease, it may be a license. Somehow they're given secure tenure over the minerals that they have explored and proved exist and, and invested in, even though those minerals are in the ground. So a similar regime is going to arise in space um, because without it, you won't get the investment. And that will then give companies secure tenure over, over this material. They can make the investment, they can extract the material. Uh, it's already being recognized uh, in a lot of countries. If you extract the material, you then own it. It's similar to pulling fish out of the ocean. Once they're on your deck, they're yours. And so at that point, you can buy and sell this material and it becomes part of the, the global property rights regimes that, uh, that we have.
So all of this is, is evolving, but this is, this is the, the likely direction that it's going to go. And then there'll be a, a global register of you know, who is operating, who has secure tenure and, and is making investments. And it's actually um, the Outer Space Treaty has a provision saying uh, everyone in space has the right to not be interfered with. And that non-interference, then if I have an operation on an asteroid and you come and interfere with that by setting up an operation next door, creating a lot of dust, doing things like this, then you know, that, that's, that's protected against. So, so that's how these regimes are, are likely to, that, that's sort of the legal framework that these are likely to come under. Of course, it could be a completely new framework. We'll have to see how it evolves. I, I think it will likely have to be a new framework because I am not sure if uh, the other framework is going to hold. Now, joint ventures are beginning to be established as we see between some governments and private businesses, especially the Luxembourg, uh, you know, is aggressively pursuing space mining and uh, entering into partnerships. So where do you see these joint ventures going? Yeah, I think the, uh, the government of Luxembourg has done something very smart. Uh, back in the 1980s, uh, Luxembourg... Uh, invested and supported uh, SES, one of the first telecommunications satellite companies. And, uh, and as a result, that company now employs uh, four or 500 people in Luxembourg. Uh, the Luxembourg government owns a stake in that company through its sovereign wealth fund. It's been a very successful enterprise for, for Luxembourg. Um, so they've looked at that and they've said, okay, we have a history of, of mining. That the country was orig originally uh, an iron ore and steel country. And then they have a history of space. So they've, they've taken that existing expertise and they're now trying to, to create a new economic uh, uh, industry, a new activity before anybody else gets in. They want to get the jump on it. And, uh, and so they've, they've put their money where their mouth is. They've put up $200 million to help seed this, to, to bring the asteroid mining companies to Luxembourg. You know, it's, a, it's a very, very proactive and forward-looking thing that they've done. Yes, so it so, seems, uh, yes, you are right about that. And it seems that they are also getting very serious about this uh, water-powered asteroid mining technology. And mm -hmm. they are all set to, from what I read, is that they are set to launch water-powered asteroid mining technology in very near future. So this is very exciting. And uh, it, it seems that they are very aggressively pursuing this. That's absolutely right. They've, they've taken a, a holistic approach. They've looked at what regulatory environment needs to be brought into existence. They've looked at the technologies. They've looked at uh, um, you know, various things with the international collaborations to make sure that that's all, all aligned and, and going to be successful. So I'm, I'm very impressed by what Luxembourg has done. I think they're very thorough and, uh, and they're, they're moving ahead cautiously but strongly. Uh, yes. other, countries, other countries are looking at that example and saying, how do we play in this space? Can we get uh, some of those businesses and some of that activity in, in our country? And so you know, we, we're seeing now uh, a, lot of, a lot of countries have realized this is coming. This is going to be a reality. And the question is, how do the companies play? How do the countries play in that space um, you know, and, and add it just to the, the economic activity that, uh, that is happening? Yes, very true. Now, it seems China is also getting ready to send people to live on asteroids and mine them. From your assessment, how prepared is China for this? China's been moving very aggressively in, with its space program. It's, it's quite impressive. They, uh, they are now um, effectively one of two countries that can put people in space. But those two countries are Russia and China. The US has taken a break for the last decade after retiring the space shuttle, but it will soon return to, uh, to human launch capability uh, with SpaceX and Boeing and possibly others. Um, so yeah, China, China have a very unique capability there being able to launch people. They also have a, uh, a very active exploration program, uh, especially their lunar program. And so they're looking very much at the moon. And they've announced plans for uh, their own space station because they've previously been excluded from the International Space Station. Uh, and they're also looking at, uh, at plans for a lunar facility. So, so these are very, very exciting. They're doing them for a number of reasons. Partly it's, it's national pride. And this, is, this is showing that China is now a great nation and, uh, and can sit with everybody else in the world and achieve what everybody else is doing. But also they're, they're looking at what the economic potential is, uh, very significant. And, uh, and they want to, to play in this, in this um, regime uh, as everybody else does. Um, but just like Luxembourg, China are prepared to put their money where their mouth is. They're making those investments. They're, they're encouraging their companies to, to get involved. And, uh, and no doubt they're working the business plans and, uh, and trying to see where, uh, where they can make it viable. Yes, 
Yes, definitely. Now, how many other nations are getting ready to explore other than China and Luxembourg and uh, USA and probably Russia? Which other nations do you see uh, going that path? Yeah, so in uh, it, when it comes to the asteroid mining, it's, it, it's generally accepted this is going to be um, private companies, just as, as mining is, uh, is private, private companies, but they're supported by governments, not just you know, 50 years of technology development. Which is it just built the infrastructure and the capability, but also um, you know other other means of support. So Luxembourg has has put up 200 million. It's prepared to make direct investments in companies that move to Luxembourg, but it's also providing funds for for research and development and technologies. It's doing a lot of things. The European Space Agency, so all across Europe, they are looking very seriously at, at supporting. Uh, a lot of activities as well. Uh, we've mentioned that the US where regulations have been passed around asteroid mining and then the private companies are out seeking investments. But NASA is also um, pursuing several asteroid missions as well. Uh, and that provides the geological um, data and, and models and, and certainty that de-risks asteroid mining. So so that's happening as well. So the um, other ones, Japan. Japan have, uh, have already uh, returned a very, very small sample. They, they had some bad luck with their probe. They brought it back from the brink of death about a dozen times and succeeded in bringing back some small particles from an asteroid. But they've launched their second asteroid sample mission as well. So, so Japan are, are, are moving uh, fairly aggressively uh, as well. And so that's, that's good to see. So uh, I think there we got uh, Europe, US, China, Japan, um, and then, uh, of course, the Russians have incredible capability, and I'd expect to see uh, at least partnerships with the Russians, if not uh, Russian-led initiatives as well. I see. I see. Very interesting. So now, what are space mining ownership rights? It, it, any asteroid resource obtained in outer space, is it the property of the entity that uh, obtained this resource, or who does it belong to? If, if let's say someone goes and uh, gets a lot of, uh, at this point, water only, but in the future, they get uh, platinum or they get iron ore or nickel or, you know, anything else. Who does it belong to? The, does that, you know, belong to the entity that goes and gets the, uh, the mining company that goes and gets it? Or how would it work? The country would get it or how would it work? So under the, under the Outer Space Treaty, it's left uh, a little bit ambiguous. Uh, no country is allowed to assert sovereignty directly or indirectly over a celestial body, um, which which is is itself a little ambiguous because celestial body is not defined. And if you can if you can take an asteroid and move it, is it is it chattel or real estate? Um, and, and so the lawyers love to debate the, these uncertainties. It's uh, it's a lot of fun for them. Um, but the pragmatic um, reality is that. Uh, some countries have now passed regulations, the US and, and Luxembourg is in the process, and there are other countries as well um, that will clarify uh, what's in the Outer Space Treaty and, and how that's going to be treated in those countries. So in the US, if a company extracts material, they own that material. So just like going and fishing in international waters, the fish aren't yours until they're on, on the deck of the ship. But once they're on the ship, they're your fish. You legally own them under the laws of the country that you're flagged under. And, uh, and then that's, that's recognized internationally. So these still have to evolve, but uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, if we steer away from ownership of the asteroids, but we do allow secure tenure over the mineral resources that are being explored and proven and mined. Uh, that secure tenure will have a lot of caveats on it, just as the regulations around terrestrial mining. You can't, you can't uh, secure tenure over something and then sit on it. You have to actually use it, otherwise, that's uh, those those rights go away, and so you know the, the countries who are who who have those minerals are looking to create economic activity. Similarly, uh, you know the, the the global economy wants the supply of these resources. That's the the way that everybody's going to benefit is if they enter into circulation. They can be bought and sold. They can be used for the benefit of of anyone who who wants the particular services or goods that are produced using those those resources. So we want to make sure that, that it's effective and it can be used. And I think there's a, there's a global consensus that this is a good thing. This is something that's going to happen. It needs to be done right. It's just a question of which version of right we're going to choose. True, true. And I see your point there. But do you see a need for an international treaty which deals with the possibilities of conflict between nation states or use of force in space or any criminal activity 
that would be possible in space transportation and travel in the coming years? Yeah, I think that, uh, that it's inevitable that that will evolve. Uh, it may be under the existing outer space treaty, which, which uh, while it's, it's not specific, can, uh, can evolve in its interpretation and, and the consensus among nations. And, uh, and so that's, that's going to happen over time. Um, I think that, uh, that that's already starting to happen. The fact that countries are moving and setting up their own laws, that's actually required under the Outer Space Treaty that they, uh, they administer the Outer Space Treaty, um, that, that each country does that. So the US responded correctly when asteroid mining companies set up. They said, all right, we, we're required under the Outer Space Treaty to actually decide how to regulate them. So we'll, we'll come up with a solution. And, and that's what's happened. Uh, to make it work effectively, there needs to be uh, at least a cross recognition between all of the countries that are that are regulating these, so that um, you know you you can't have somebody from a, a different country come in and say, well, my country doesn't recognise that that your country has given you uh, has uh, granted you secure tenure. So there needs to be a, a cross recognition, and again, all of this will will naturally evolve as the needs arise. But I don't know that it's necessary to have. The regulations proceed aggressively precede uh, the activity. <clears throat> I think some of it can evolve as as we find need for it. Um, the the big thing that, that I look at is you know, what what do the investors see their risk profile? And uh, and in the mining industry, there's a uh, a line in the um, in the the calculations of the value of, of a potential mining operation that's called country risk. And, and that includes things like the tax rate changing or the government uh, appropriating and nationalizing the operation or you know, several, several other things that, that, that could happen, perhaps a conflict arising in that country. And so some countries have a, a discount rate applied due to country risk of up to 50%. Every year there's 50% chance that the complete investment will be lost. And that's, that's very extreme. And that's, that's a country that's effectively at war. Um, but it's not uncommon to have discount rates as high as, as six or eight uh, percent. Very stable countries that are that have um, you know a, a long-standing history of, of stable regulations. They all have discount rates that are you know, effectively zero. And so when when investors look at the space industry and the, and the this asteroid mining, and considering what this country risk is and what the discount rate is that needs to get applied. And it's non-zero until the regulations are not just in place, but they're tested, that they're tried, that there's uh, a history of it. So we, we have to deal with that when doing the, the math and convincing investors that this is worthwhile investing. We have to seriously consider what is the risk to the business from the current state of regulations. So yeah, in that, some regulation in advance that gives certainty as to how it's going to be treated is is a very positive thing and that's why again the us luxembourg a few other countries are enacting uh regulations uh, legislation and and then forming regular regulations around that legislation so that there's a, so that business can then proceed sure no absolutely now i mean there are space law experts who are saying that space resources are common goods for everyone across nations so it, it is also possible that we are nearing a warfare for the space contested commons because uh, a lot of nations would not agree to uh, the fact that you know whoever mines it whoever gets it they will you know be able to keep it so i, I don't see a very clear you know future in there there is going to be a lot of uh, conflict uh, emerging because of the very nature of the resources that we are after. But from your assessment, who dominates this futuristic industry at this point? Uh, it is still a futuristic industry because we still have to set our foot on asteroids to be able to get the resources. So who is dominating at this point? Yeah, it's a, it's a futuristic industry because at the moment there's no operation or asteroid mine that, uh, that is in place on an asteroid. But, uh, but that can change rapidly. Um, in terms of the uh, the conflict, though, I think I disagree. There's there's no conflict likely in the next ten or twenty years. It'll be it'll be well after that, but but inevitably you know, there will be some friction at some point, and that will have to get resolved. So, um, you know, there, there's more concern about other things that are happening in Earth orbit that uh, that that you know should should keep people awake and, and do keep some people awake. Uh, and so that's that's not a bad thing that people are thinking about it and focusing on it. Um, but uh, your, your other part of your question was was who is likely to dominate this space? And I think the answer to that is whoever makes the biggest investments. Uh, the the technology you, know, you can go and buy the technology um, commercially. 
and uh, and get anything done in space that uh, you know, from anywhere by anyone. Uh, if you if you come along with a check and you can you can buy yourself access to to asteroid mining. Um, whoever puts in the most money will have the most asteroid mines. Um, this is just, just like any other part of the economy, I think. Um, but there are countries that have you know, distinct uh, advantages because they're they're prepared to invest because they have a, a cultural history of mining. Um, but uh, but also you have to consider it's going to be a large ecosystem. This will start small and evolve rapidly. And if you look at the mining industry uh, terrestrially, um, there are there are different areas of specialty. Um, you know, geologists and uh, doing assessments, uh, exploration companies just doing early stage exploration, later stage exploration, manufacturing companies, the extraction companies, the operators, the insurance, the licensing and process. And there's, there's so many parts to this ecosystem. I expect that it will evolve similarly into a, a very diverse ecosystem. And then, um, you know, different centers of expertise will, will come to the fore for different aspects of this. And uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see how it evolves. Yes, absolutely. It will be very interesting. What role your enterprise heliocentric technologies plays in uh, space mining at this point? So I was formerly the, the CEO of Deep Space Industries, and, uh, and that is now on a, on a very clear and, and interesting track to, to mine asteroids. Um, we have, our business model includes um, making the technology that we develop available. We want to get those thrusters installed on, on as many spacecraft so that all the spacecraft can use water as propellant, and then we'll have uh, a market that we can sell to. So that's been a very successful strategy, and uh, and the company is, uh, is making good revenues. So I've moved from that now to other parts of the economy uh, to work on demand creation for these materials. So um, Heliocentric, it's a, it's a launch pad for, for setting up companies. Uh, I've set several companies up previously. The, uh, the most recent ones are looking at in-space manufacturing, uh, space entertainment, and also considering how uh, the asteroid mining companies will uh, will eventually need a commodities market, and uh, and considering how that might be established. Um, there are there are several other companies that I'm advising and helping out, but those are the main things that I'm working. On. Very interesting. What would you like to tell our global viewers and listeners about the coming tomorrow of space age? I think that right now. This, uh, the space industry is, is a bit like computers in 1980. We've, we've realized we can make them smaller and cheaper and, and aren't exactly sure what we can do with them yet. And nobody really knows the internet is coming. I think that's the situation we're at with the space industry. We figured out how to make rockets work. We figured out that satellites can be smaller. Um, we, we've got a, a lot of options of things we can do, and, and a lot of companies are scrambling to to develop things as quickly as possible and, and assert positions um, you know, in this industry. But what's going to happen next is is the unleashing of entrepreneurs, and we're seeing that more and more every year. So it's a it's an exciting place. I think the investments are going to keep coming in. I think the value creation is going to be incredible, and uh, and so it's it's just it's a great time to be in the middle of this industry. Yes, it is absolutely wonderful time. Thank you, Daniel, for participating in Risk Roundup today. We appreciate your thoughtful insight on space mining and exploration, and our global viewers and listeners would benefit tremendously from the information you provided on the democratization of space and the role asteroids and space mining could likely play in the imminent space age in the coming years. Even if a single individual or entity across nations can come up with an idea to innovate and develop technology, to advance the emerging space age based on the understanding they received from the discussion we had today. This Risk Roundup Dialogue has been of service and we thank you for that. Thanks, Jay Shree. It's been uh, great to be part of it. Wonderful, Daniel. So while the space technology advances could and scarcity of essential minerals as we know it, the democratization of space and asteroid mining, space mining will also likely bring complex conflicts and challenges in the coming years. It is important to evaluate its security impact on cyberspace, geospace, and space, in short, referred to as CGS. Risk Group Cybersecurity Risk Research Center, Geosecurity Risk Research Center, and Space Security Risk Research Center are created for this very reason to identify, evaluate, and manage the risk facing NGIO and CGS, that means nations, its government industries, organizations, and academia in cyberspace, geospace, and space. We at Risk Group believe that risk management, security, and peace. They walk together hand in hand. 
तो सिक्योरिटी इज रिलेटेड टू मैनेजमेंट ऑफ थ्रेट्स एंड पीस टू द मैनेजमेंट ऑफ कॉन्फ्लिक्ट रिस्क मैनेजमेंट इज रिलेटेड टू मैनेजमेंट ऑफ सिक्योरिटी वेलनरेबिलिटी वेल एज मैनेजमेंट ऑफ कॉन्फ्लिक्ट and it is not possible to conceive any one of the three without the existence of the other two all three concepts feed into each other we believe that the security we build for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secure for everyone across nations tradition becomes our security so if we build a culture of managing risk effectively it will lead us to security and security will lead us to peace let's manage the existing and emerging risk together for more information on the risk roundup to watch the risk roundup videos or hear the risk roundup podcast please go to riskgroupllc.com and do not forget to subscribe and share until next time i'm jayeshri pandya host of risk roundup signing off see you next time thank you